thank you everybody for showing up. I know a lot of you. So I'm delighted to introduce my sister, Sarah Betzler. Hello. To do this program, she came from Madison, um, where she, hi, where she works and went to school. She got her bachelor's at Gustavus Adolphus and then went to Madison for uh, environment and resources, environment which for resources. me translates to habitat restoration. Habitat restoration. She's done a lot of work with the Raptor Center, with um, uh, different wildlife rehab clinics, Crane Foundation, all sorts of things. She's really into habitat re restoration. Um, and she's done a lot with butterfly tagging uh, at the uh, Madison Audubon Society. Madison Audubon Society. And I'm really glad that she has the resources and the skills to teach us this today. Um, many thanks to all of our individual donors for making this program possible, including the Prescott Foundation and Gertrude Sheely Foundation. All right. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. I never get um, applause. That's great. <laughs> I, I want to thank the um, Great River Road Visitor Center, too, for hosting me here. Um, I also, first of all, I want to thank Madison Audubon Society. If any of you are ever down in Madison or near Madison, um, they're a great organization. They have a couple of great nature preserves and restored prairies just outside the city. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, they lent me all of the supplies that I brought. Um, so I, I and they, they taught me how to take butterflies. Um, so I owe them a lot for this. And I also want to thank monarchwatch.org who um, provided the tags and who are sort of managing this whole migration tagging project. Um, I don't work for any of those organizations. I'm here as a volunteer, but those are, those are the things that make this possible. Um, so um, clearly all of you more or less know what a monarch is. It looks like <laughs> things kind of took off on their own. Um, but I will just start by giving a little bit of an overview of monarch biology. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the threats that they're facing right now because they are in trouble. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the tagging program and then each of you get a net and you just get to chase butterflies around until we all have to go home. <laughs> um, so to begin with, monarchs are a kind of butterfly, which is a kind of insect. Um, Monarchs are in the order Lepidoptera, which if you if you look back to the ancient Greek, that's got an interesting meaning. It means scale wing. You might have heard um, heard other words with that ptero word in it. Uh, anybody? Can anybody think of a word that has p t e r o? Does that sound familiar at all? You can. Uh, any of you kids? Do you know anything? Ptero? Yes. Well, not about that, but the scaled stuff. Yeah. Isn't it because when you look at it with a microscope, they have scales? Because I did that at my house with butterfly wings that I found. That is very true. Yes. Butterfly, so they're called scale wings because their wings are actually covered in little scales. Um, which, uh, it makes them very delicate. Butterflies, if you ever touch the wings, don't ever touch a butterfly wing except under, you know, very specific circumstances like we're going to today. Because usually the scales will rub off very easily and then they have a hard time flying. Um, so the, the lepido comes from the word for scale. Ptero means wing. You might have heard it before in words like pterodactyl. Um, many other insect groups have that in their name, like diptera or the flies, that means two wing. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. Um, if you've heard of a caddisfly, caddisflies are very closely related to butterflies. They're in the order um, Trichoptera, which means hair wing. And instead of being covered in scales, their wings are covered in little tiny hairs. Um, so you can, you can see the relationship there. So butterflies are some of our most colorful insects. Um, they're, they're sort of defined by this transformation they go through from caterpillars into a chrysalis, into a pupa, and then they declose, they, they emerge as a butterfly. Um, and as um, with most species of butterflies, the caterpillar and the adult eat very different things. Well, with all species they do. What do caterpillars eat? Does anybody know? Yes. You know what they eat. What do caterpillars eat? Well, monarch caterpillars eat milkweed. More generally, caterpillars eat, eat plants. They eat leaves. Um, every different kind of caterpillar has its own kind of leaf that it likes. Some kind of butterflies, their caterpillars will eat many different kinds of leaves. Some butterflies, their caterpillars will only eat one very specific kind of leaf. That's like the monarchs. Uh, but as adults, what do butterflies eat? Who knows that? Butterflies eat wings. No, nectar. That's correct. Butterflies eat nectar. 
Um, so nectar is also produced by plants. It's produced by flowers. It doesn't need to be the same kind of plant that the, the caterpillars ate. So a lot of people think of monarchs, they associate them with milkweeds, which is absolutely correct. You cannot have monarchs without milkweeds. But adult monarch butterflies, they actually prefer to eat other things. So they eat um, like the plants in the butterfly in the butterfly tent. Those are uh, golden rods. Monarchs really like golden rods. They really like things like liatris. They like things that are purple. They like things that are yellow. Um, they like things that are easy for them to see too, which for a butterfly, big masses of flowers are easier to see because of the way their eyes work. So if you want to attract adult butterflies to your yard, things like that butterfly garden over there are great because it's a big mass of yellow. It's easy for them to spot. Um, so monarchs like, um, they will, they will nectar off of milkweed plants, that is true, but you need to have both things. You need to have milkweed for the caterpillars to eat, and you need to have something that's blooming with nectar in it when they need to eat as adults. Um, so that's why a lot of times you'll see a butterfly garden and you think, well, I mean, I don't see any milkweed in this butterfly garden. How is it a butterfly garden? And it would be better if it had milkweed, um, but oftentimes what you really look for is a, is a flower to nectar on. So those are two things that monarchs need. Can anybody else think of anything that a monarch might need, either as a, as a larva or as an adult? Yes? Space to fly. Space to fly, all right. Do they ever need to drink water? Yeah, butterflies need to drink water. They also need minerals. So a lot of times you'll see butterflies doing something called puddling, where there will be literally a mud puddle in the ground. Sometimes you see this on dirt roads and it'll just be ringed with butterflies drinking out of it. And they're drinking that water because it has water and it has minerals in it like salt. Um, what else do butterflies need? They need a, a well, butterflies are, are cold-blooded animals. They can't generate their own heat. They need warmth. And then when it's not warm, they need a safe place to roost. So at night, oftentimes, monarch butterflies will roost together in, um, they, they like pine trees or like, um, um, coniferous trees, just because of the way the needles kind of create a nice, dense, little, little comfortable space, but they'll, they'll roost other places. Um, but it's important for them to have that shelter. They need shelter from storms, from winds, they need places to hide from predators. Um, so those are all kind of things that build a monarch habitat. Can anybody think of how any of those things have changed in recent years? There's less of them. There's less of them. Um, across, across the United States, now first of all, I should have said this at the beginning, monarchs are unique to North America. You don't find them in Europe, you don't find them in Asia, you find them in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And across North America, across all three of those countries, habitats have been changing drastically over the last few years. Monarch butterflies, have their population has dropped drastically in the last several decades, and this is due to changes in habitat. Um, they need the milkweed, and usually milkweed is kind of a common plant in sort of ditches and disturbed areas, in prairies too, and in good habitats. Um, and in the last several decades, the, the amount of milkweed has, has decreased in vast areas, and that is because of changes in farming practices primarily. Um, so when farmers start using herbicides more, the herbicides will kill the milkweed. And the reason that farmers can use herbicides more is largely because they've been developing crops that are resistant to herbicides. So the, if the crops aren't damaged by the herbicide, they can use more of it to kill the weeds, which means they kill the milkweed at the same time. Other things that are, that are damaging habitat, just generally making more land into farmland, so loss of natural areas. Um, climate change can affect butterflies, sometimes in an unexpected way, like for instance, you may have heard that monarch caterpillars are toxic because they eat milkweed. This is true. Monarch uh, milkweed plants produce toxins. Monarch caterpillars are adapted to be immune to those toxins, but then when they eat them, they incorporate them into their body, which means that anything that eats a monarch caterpillar will get sick. Um, so birds might eat a monarch caterpillar once, but they'll never do it a second time. Um, but the problem is, with climate change, as the ca carbon dioxide levels increase in the atmosphere, for some reason, and I don't think we fully understand why, but it has been shown experimentally that milkweeds produce less toxins under those circumstances. Which means that the butterflies are less toxic to predators, which means that they're more likely to be eaten. Um, so this is, you know, you think of climate change, you think of, oh, the, weather's, the weather patterns will be different, you know, winters might be warmer. Those are true as well. Those also affect butterflies. Um, but it can have some unexpected consequences as well. And as far as the weather patterns, um, monarch butterfly biology includes a migration. So monarchs, um, this is why we're here today. We're here to tag them. The butterflies that you see today will be flying all the way south to Mexico. And they overwinter in Mexico. Um, but then when they come north, 
So they have this multiple generation system. So the ones that we take today will fly to Mexico, they'll spend the winter in Mexico hibernating in trees, and then those same butterflies will fly north to maybe Texas. They settle in Texas, they reproduce in Texas, there's a new batch of caterpillars, those caterpillars come north to maybe Kansas. Then they do the same thing, they have the same life cycle. Um, these butterflies that are flying north, they have a shorter life cycle. The butterflies that stay north, so the ones that, that are hatched in Kansas, they'll fly up to Wisconsin and Minnesota and Canada. And they have a couple of cycles of, of reproducing in place. And those adult butterflies, they tend to live about three weeks after they come out of the, out of the chrysalis, after they hatch. Um, but then the last generation they have, the one that we're tagging today, it hatches in August and September, or it closes in August and September. Those adult butterflies will live through the winter. Those adult butterflies are physically different from the other butterflies as well. They're stronger. This is why we can handle them. So if you're out in um, May or June and you see a monarch, don't try to catch it. The wings will be weaker. The scales will come off more easily. But the butterflies that eclose, that, that emerge as butterflies in August and September, they have much tougher wings. That's why if we're very gentle, we can handle them without hurting them. But monarchs have this multi-generational um, sort of system. And weather patterns can really affect that. So in the spring, you might hear news about, oh, this might be a really good monarch here, it might be a really bad monarch here. And that's because the weather in the very specific small area where they overwinter in Mexico can affect how many monarchs survive the winter. If you have a, a warmer winter than normal, those monarchs might not be able to hibernate as well. They need temperatures to be, you know, at a certain level before they can effectively hibernate. Um, if there's a forest fire, if there's a storm that hits that place, um, if there's a lot of logging down there, if a disease hits it, all of those things can affect the monarchs as they move north. Um, like there was a year a couple years ago where the, the generation that overwintered in Mexico was moving up to Texas and they got hit by a, a storm. Um, I think it, I believe it was a winter storm. There was a lot of ice and snow and hail and that monarch population just got decimated. And then it had to recover as it moved north and as it, it came north and reproduced throughout the summer. Um, and of course, all of those weather patterns with climate change, what we're seeing is an intensification of storms. We're seeing more frequent storms. We're seeing um, drastic temperature changes. So all of those things can affect butterflies. It also affects how they know sort of when to move south. So the, the temperature changes are kind of what, what trigger the changes in the adult butterfly. Um, so that they, they emerge, their, their that, that migrating form. Um, so those are, those are some things that are threatening butterflies. Many other things can threaten butterflies. Uh, and the reason that we're concerned about this, of course, is that, I mean, for one thing, monarchs are cool. We don't want them to go extinct. Um, but more generally, monarchs are, are sort of a signal to us. If the monarchs are in trouble, what else might be in trouble? You know, we have over here, we, you might have noticed there's um, monarch caterpillars. Um, we have a couple of monarch caterpillars. We have a couple of other caterpillars that are a kind of tiger moth. Those tiger moths also eat milkweed. So if monarchs are in trouble because there's not very much milkweed, the tiger moths are also in trouble. But people don't know as much about tiger moths. They're not as popular, they're not as pretty. Um, but they're just as important. You know, ecology is all about that. Ecology is about how, how everything depends on everything else. Um, and if something bad is happening to one particular group of animals that you can see, it's probably also happening to a bunch of other groups of animals and plants, um, all kinds of other life forms that you can't see that you're not necessarily aware of. So it's important to save monarchs not only for themselves, but also for everything else that you would be saving at the same time. It's a sort of an umbrella effect. Um, so that's we come to why we're here today. There are a lot of different things you can do to help monarchs. You can plant a butterfly garden. Um, you can, you know, sprinkle milkweed seeds along the roadside. You can, you can build rain gardens into your city. You can do things on a, on a larger scale. You can volunteer at prairie restorations, things like that. Um, and then this group, Monarch Watch. Monarch Watch um, was started in, in um, Lawrence, Kansas. And it is a, a nonprofit organization that tags monarch butterflies. So they have these tiny little stickers. They're about the size of the end of your finger. Okay. And they've got an, a unique number on them. And they're, they're developed to be, um, hello. <laughs> they're, they're developed so that they won't hurt the butterfly. You know, you'd think like putting a sticker on the wing, that might be bad for them, and it could be. It could be if you put it in the wrong place. It could be if it was too heavy. It could be if it was poisonous to them. Um, but they developed these very carefully so that they don't hurt the butterflies if you do it right. 
Um, so you put the tag on the butterfly, on the migrating butterfly, and then when it gets to Mexico, they have people there who look for those tags and who collect them and send the information back to the organization. So in this way, they can get an idea of the population numbers, whether they're going up or going down. They can begin to understand how many monarchs make it south. Um, they have a return rate of about 1%, which doesn't mean that only 1% of butterflies make it to Mexico. Um, but they can use that math. I'm not sure, actually, the percent that make it to Mexico, but they can use that information to calculate the percent that make it to Mexico, and that gives them an understanding of the kind of dangers that the butterflies are facing on the way south. Um, and it just helps raise awareness. Like, you all are here to, to learn about this, to tag butterflies, to get a little bit closer to them. Um, and that means that, that you're going to learn a little bit. You're going to go home and, and tell your friends and family. Um, you might plant some milkweed when you wouldn't have otherwise. So raising awareness is a really big part of this kind of environmental effort. So with all of that, I've been talking at you for a few minutes now. Um, does anybody have any questions yet? Sorry, I have a question. Yes. And I think you covered this, but it like went a little bit too fast past my head. You, the last generation, the monarch generation that was Eclose, Eclose, that Eclose's and then does the big migration south, mm -hmm. is stronger. Yep. Is, did you say it was the temperature that tells the metamorph, like the caterpillar that turns into the butterfly that goes south, is that caterpillar different? Or is it just like it happens to go into the chrysalis and then in the chrysalis the temperature signals it to become this stronger morph? I believe it's the temperature okay. in the chrysalis. Wow. I, I will look that up afterwards. Um, I don't I don't want to be telling you guys something that's incorrect, but at least for a lot of animals, temperature will signal that kind of thing. Huh. Um, so even if it's not the case for butterflies, changing temperature will affect, for instance, maybe when a certain species of bird migrates or when a certain type of tree starts dropping its leaves. Um, so I'll, I'll look that up specifically. I actually don't know. It might also be day length. So coming back to Texas, it's a little chillier, so maybe they don't live as long as when they get to Kansas. And Kansas, they're still coming colder temperatures, so maybe that lifespan is shorter. Is that what you're trying to say? Shorter span of time. It might be. Also, they to, to systems. They also sort of move north as the temperature allows. So it's, yeah. you know, even if the temperature isn't specifically what's triggering them to change, um, they, they can't, butterflies can't really move around too much under about 60 degrees. So temperature will limit, you know, as they're moving north, it'll limit. They can't move north to a point where it's colder than they can move. Yeah, um, so if that makes sense to you. Um, so another thing that happens is if, if temperatures are, are getting warmer earlier in the season as they move north, they might end up moving north to a place where the flowers haven't started blooming yet, and then they're in trouble because they need a lot of energy to keep moving. Um, this is this is a very long journey for them. Um, so I'll, I'll look that up. I'll get back to you about that. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. So I'm going to demonstrate a monarch tagging with this monarch that Clover very uh, very skillfully caught. Actually, Clover, would you like to come up and help me with this? So what we have here, should people get closer? Yeah, you can you can all get closer if you'd like to, to see this. What we have here is a data sheet, and I think I'm going to have one of these clipboards, and Emily is going to have one of these clipboards. So as as we go through this tagging, um, when you catch a butterfly, bring it to one or the other of us, and we can collect some data. Um, so what's going to happen here is that we're going to put a sticker on it. The sticker's got a specific unique number on it, and then. Like I said, about 1% of monarchs are, are recovered in Mexico. So if they recover that monarch, and if they have the right contact information, they can send you a certificate and say, hey, look, we found your butterfly. Um, so if you want that, you're going to have to put your, I think what we'll do is we'll collect the names and addresses of people who would like that to happen on a separate sheet. And then on this sheet, just put your name. And then I'm going to copy all this information over to a different sheet. Um, so we're, we're not going to exactly match their format, but I'll make sure and send them what they need. And then if you want to get that certificate, if you don't want to get that certificate, if you want to put your address down, that's fine too. Um, it'll come to the visitor center. The visitor center will just know that so many monarchs are recovered. Um, cool. So they'll still have what they need. Um, so we're going we're gonna to put down the tag number. We're going to decide whether the monarch is a male or a female, and I'll show you how to tell that. And then we're going to put the name or just the visitor center. So, do this. I'm going to show everybody else. So, like I said, these monarchs in this generation only are strong enough that you can grab them very gently by the waist. So, you kind of, you have it in the, the bag of the net, you reach your hand in and you pinch sort of near the base of the wings. Um, he's, he's being, I can't tell yet. <laughs> um, he's being kind of uncooperative. I put my finger on his feet so that he grabbed on my finger before I got on the wings. 
That is a very good okay. trick, actually. So that he'll kind of calm down and he's not only by his wings. <laughs> Their little feet, just like... Yeah, they, they do. They feel more comfortable when they can hold on to something. So she has a very good point there, is that if you kind of give them a finger to stand on. So, I wonder if that's really a monarch. Because there's two replicas, I thought. There are. Do you know what they're called? Um, no, but I know that the wing shapes are different. Could you offer me a finger, shape? please? Mm. Yeah, okay, yeah. If you actually want to hold it. Um, so the two, the two that live around here that look like monarchs are called viceroys and the other one is called a queen. Um, so it's funny, they're all sort of named after rulers. Um, this is a monarch though, and you can tell, can you tell if it's a male or a female? Um, I think, well I don't know which one it is, but it's thicker, so I can't remember if it was thicker meaning male or female, but... You are right, this is thicker. this is the thicker one, and the one with the thicker bands is a female. Okay. Another way to tell, if you, and again, it's hard to do this without without losing control of it, but if you sort of gently part the wings, um, and if you guys would like to come closer and see this, you may. Um, so a male butterfly will have a little black dot in the middle of the hind wing down here. And I, I have some demonstration butterflies I can show you that on as well. So if you want to hold on to her wings right there. Um, yeah, so on this here, you can see as well, these, these two butterflies, there's a story behind them, which I can tell you later. Um, this one is a female and this one is a male. And you can see in the middle of the hind wings on the male, there are two black dots. Let them go okay? So the black dots are, are kind of a scent pouch. They produce pheromones. We don't know, scientists don't know exactly what those are for, but that's one way to tell males from females. So to tag this, this beautiful lady, these are the tags. Oh, she's gonna tag them to see. And it's important to not get the oils of your skin on the tag because it can it can affect how sticky it is. So I'm going to peel this off with a toothpick. Does it go on the back? It does. So on the back of the wing, and I can sticker. again show anybody who can't see right now. There's a, a central cell. It's um it's kind of mitten shaped, and you just want to put the sticker. Now this one is A E A A E Z five nine five. Can somebody help me remember that? A A E Z five nine five. And you're gonna put that right in the middle of that cell. Right down. Kind of roll it on and squeeze it very gently. A A E Z five nine five. And you can release her whenever you want. Look she gonna say bye bye butterfly. Can you say bye? There she goes. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> Alright, well. Good job. In my time. <laughs> Alright. So does anybody need to see any of that again? Does anybody want to see pictures? Um, otherwise you can all just grab a net and one more thing. Um, there's a, a sort of a trick to catching butterflies. Um, first of all, I mean, there's there's not really just you know you, you catch them however you can. It's easier to catch them if they're landing on something. So if you if it's flying around and you're kind of chasing it around in the air, you're not likely to catch it. Feel free to try. It can be more fun. Um, <laughs> I would imagine you could just damage it. Yes. You know if, if it kind of hits that or something that can hurt them. We're we're not here to hurt them. Um, but so it's easier if it's sitting on a flower and you you got to kind of sneak up very slowly. And then you whisk it, you scoop up, because it's gonna try to fly up to get away. So you can scoop up and then sort of flip it over. And then if you trap it in the bag of the net here, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, all right, so if anybody has any questions, come find me or Emily. Um, once you catch a monarch, come find one of us and we'll help you tag it. And again, if you want to be the one to personally receive that certificate if your butterfly is found, you're just going to have to make sure and identify, give us your name for that butterfly and give us your address at some point. Like Miss Matthew, All right. Name the yep, there we go. And you may let them go. Whenever you're ready. Oh, there you go. Oh, good job. Oh. Kathy Oss planted the butterfly garden and she includes parsley every year for the swallowtail yeah, caterpillars. So here's another little one. Goodness. 
everybody should plant plant butterfly gardens and rain gardens in your yard. You know, it's um, there's so much that could be done on an urban level, just within even within a town like Prescott, within a bigger city like St. Paul or Minneapolis. Um, small gardens like this can make a world of difference for urban habitat. They can provide habitat for butterflies, bees, birds, um, all kinds of things. So, plant native plants. That's I guess my final thought. Okay, thank you. Thank